Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we have uh, two guests on the show talking about a very exciting new uh, project, a uh, money-free society and a money-free community. We're trying to do some on-the-ground work to build up a sustainable way of living uh, without money uh, for people who are tired of money and are in touch with moral principles and are genuinely good people that want to survive uh, you know, without having to be enslaved by the money system. So please welcome uh, Celine Kaiser and Judah, and they're going to talk about a, a new project that they're working on. Thanks. Thanks for being on the show, guys. It's lovely to have you. Thank you. Uh, basically, what we're in the process of doing is setting up a, a self-sustaining community uh, called Prairie Creek Settlement. And... Uh, we are a tribal uh, Native American uh, church that uh, we're operating under because it gives us a lot of uh, legal uh, protection by uh, doing that. We're the only uh, federally recognized Native American church there is. So uh, it's the Auckland Native American church. And <clears throat> so our umbrella is under that church, which, like I say, gives us a lot of protection uh, from government and uh, regulations and various things that uh, IRS and uh, and it's kind of uh, take me a little bit of time to really go through all the details. But we are uh, putting out uh, the information. We're publishing the information so a person can go through it step by step. In uh, the tribal aspect, the way that uh, for millions of years, mankind has lived tribally. And I think, I'm, in my opinion, that's the only reason that mankind has existed, has uh, been able to uh, stay on this earth, is because they uh, live tribally. And in the tribal way of life, uh, you don't buy and sell. Uh, mm. And a lot of people are mistaken in that they think that wampum was uh, money and a way to uh, to buy or trade, which isn't isn't true. That would take me too long to get into that, but let me just say that. So under the tribal way of life, if I have something and my tribe, one of my tribe members needs it, I give it to them. It's gifting. So the whole structure that uh, we're going to operate on is the gifting system. And that does two things. First of all, it gets us out of this world system into the tribal system so that we will be able to survive and uh, continue on. We don't want to have to uh, deal with money isn't our uh, tool. Money is the king's tool. It, it's the uh, elite's tool, the banking systems and all these things aren't the people's uh, tools. Those are the, the elite uh, rich uh, people that are kings and princes and that type of thing that live on this earth right now. And so there's a few families really that control all of that. And it's them and their, their, uh, their children and offspring that literally control the uh, banking, the international banking systems and everything. And uh, a lot of people realize that and know it, but there's a lot of people that don't. And so we'll be studying and uh, showing people uh, what's going on. So under the tribal way of, of, uh, of operating and working, it is gifting. And the good thing about gifting is, is it's not taxable. Uh, IRS or this government we have right now can't say, I can't give you something. If I have something I want to give you that, I can do that, and they can't stop me. And they can't stop you from receiving it. And they can't tax it because we did it. So uh, that is the starting uh, steps that we need to go through to get uh, in a system that is non-money. We, just Money isn't our tool. It's, mm -hmm. it's the world's tool. So uh, I would like also to... Uh, I would like also to um, to to point out, sorry, to point out that uh, 
Judah is uh, envisioning to use uh, Michael Tallinger, you know, the Ubuntu, um, one small town, Ubuntu, uh, you know, um, theory, concept to build up the, this village, and which is still using money to, for us to go money free at a certain point. So what's, what do you say about that? Yeah, uh, for us to get away from money, we've got to work our way through that. We just can't, you know, tomorrow we're not going to use money. We've got to go ahead and develop a system that works. Michael Tellinger, uh, if you're familiar with him, uh, on the, the uh, one small town, uh, we need to get to a point where we're self-sustaining, where we're growing our own food, that we are developing as much as possible internally uh, everything that we need to survive. And so food is one of the things that we're going to really have to have to survive. Housing is another thing. And uh, so, Michael, there, there's kind of, I've got to bounce back and forth here, I guess, uh, from the uh, tribal uh, aspect to Michael's aspect. And Michael, actually, a lot of the things that he uh, has come up with is tribal. I don't know. Uh, he doesn't present it that way. But actually, he is, uh, his plan is uh, a tribal way of life. And in a community, a small town, uh, that's like a, a, a village that is tribal. And uh, so we grow our own foods. Uh, in the tribal way of life, they didn't go buy food. They were hunters that went out and hunted. They were gatherers that uh, went out and got the berries and roots and, and that type of thing. Uh, and that was their various jobs were divided up so that the village or the tribe could survive. If they needed fish, well, there were people that went and, uh, and fished. Uh, if they needed a deer, there were hunters that went out and hunted. If it was deer or elk or whatever it was in uh, the geographical area that they lived in, they used the geographical area they lived in and they had to know that area and they had to live in that area. So uh, under the tribal way of uh, life is uh, there, there's a, an idea or a way of, of thinking in our society that uh, people think they live uh, on the earth and uh, the tribal way of life is you live with the earth. And so if you need housing, you gather uh, whatever is in your area and you build your own housing. If you need clothing, you go out and you, uh, you uh, harvest whatever you need to uh, provide your clothing. And uh, so they would do buckskin and things that they would uh, go ahead and use deer hides, buffalo and various things that they had available to them and they made their clothing out of those materials. And it, uh, we learn and find out that, that buckskin is really a good clothing. That is excellent clothing when you start looking at what it does. And uh, it actually breathes. But when you put buckskin on and you get out in the rain or whatever, buckskin actually breathes. It's, a, it's an excellent uh, clothing. Mm -hmm. their housing the same way they they built their housing there where they're at so they didn't have to go buy a uh, several hundred thousand dollar home from somebody else they they built their own and that tribe would gather together and they would help each other and they would get their housing built so under our concept under michael tellinger concept uh we will be doing that we have resources that uh, we will use uh, to uh, get our housing, to, to grow our food. And uh, there are excellent plans right now out there. There are people that are making several hundred thousand dollars on various ways that uh, they are doing agricultural projects. And I want to bring people in to the community that want to do those things. And so we'll be setting up and if somebody wants to uh, like, you know, we, we can uh, make uh, $500,000 off of a half acre or so. Well, we need to do that. I'll provide the, the land to do it. And there are plans that we can go do that. 
We can uh, do arranged chickens. Right now, eggs have gone sky high if you can even get them. And uh, well, we need to have our hens. And the most healthy way to do that is you have range chickens where they're not stuck in a building of several hundred thousand with, with disease and all the things that come from that. They are out on the land and they've got the good, good clean air to breathe. They've got the grass and things to, uh, to feed the insects and bugs and everything. Well, we have a plans that we can go do that. And there are people doing it that, uh, use a chicken tractor and whatever, but uh, you can make several hundred thousand dollars, you know, a short period of time off a small piece of property. And I've got all of that right now that I'm pulling together where we can present it to people to get people to come in. Under Tellinger's uh, way of dividing things, he goes to uh, one third, one third, one third type of a, uh, of a share sharing of the, uh, whatever comes in one third goes to the investor and the uh, manager. One third goes to the, uh, the workers that work, whatever it is that we're doing. And one third goes into the village. That means that everyone uh, benefits from that, the village aspect of it, because we continually build the village and uh, we take care of our, uh, our roads and, uh, our water system and uh, everything that the village uh, gets out one third, but it's used for really everyone. So a person that uh, that invests in one of these things, if they, if it takes money to, uh, to get into one of the projects, well, that individual is going to get one third of the, uh, if it makes a hundred thousand, they're going to get one third of that. And, uh, we want to be sure that they get a, their return, a good return on their investment. So if they have, uh, let's just say to make it easy, they invested a thousand dollars. Well, we want to be sure that in a short time period, they get back three thousand dollars, where they're they're they really uh, re, they've got a good return on their uh, investment that they put in, and uh, so everything that we're trying to do and accomplish. We want the people in the tribe to prosper. And we can prosper if we'll come in and work together to do what we need to do. Under Michael Tullinger's plan, everyone that lives in the village or the community, uh, they donate uh, uh, a certain amount of time monthly to the, to the, to the village. And uh, he's, he's got various depending on how many people are in the village and everything. But for the most part, what is it? He, uh, he starts off with, uh, I think it's uh, 10 hours. Now, I could be wrong. I need to look that up. But uh, whoever comes in has a certain small amount of time that they give to the village. They also give another uh, amount of time to a project. And so if they're interested in, uh, let's say that they really like uh, growing gardens, well, they will spend some of their time in the garden. And But everybody's coming and helping. So it's not just one person having to, to carry that load when you come in and you've got uh, 10 or 20 people. That, and we want people to do what they love to do because uh, that's not work when you're doing something that you really like and want to do. You go, you do that, and you're you're happy. Uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're you don't go out and have to punch somebody's time clock and just hate going to work every day doing something you don't like. So what we want to do is give people the chance and the choice that they come in and they pick something that they really want to do and love to do, so that uh, it's not a a burden to them. And uh, that's kind of the structure that we're looking at. Michael Tellinger had that kind of a, uh, of a thought process in putting together his plans. Uh, if you know, uh, if you've heard Michael, one of the things that happened with him is his father worked for a, uh, a company that did gold mining. And uh, so they were uh, in South Africa. There was a lot of gold mines and mines there. And so this, 
company that Michael Tollinger's father worked for was a gold mining company. And that company provided everything the people needed that worked for that company. And so they didn't have to spend money. If they, if they needed gasoline, they went down to the, to the uh, company's gas station and they could get gas and then pay for it because it all came from the work that, uh, that that company did, which meant the people that were in there was actually doing the work. And uh, I had the same, a similar situation that I grew up in uh, the uh, high Sierra Nevadas in, in California. My dad worked for a logging company and uh, the logging company owned all the housing. Uh, the logging company had commissary. Logging company had uh, gas station, building stations. So everything that you needed was kind of there in Westwood, California, uh, which is there's different Westwood, but this was the old Westwood. And uh, so anything that anybody needed that worked for that logging company was right there uh, for them and the logging company provided that. And they did, we had to pay uh, rent for the housing, but it was very low compared to going out and purchasing a home or renting it from somebody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those are the kind of concepts that we're, uh, we're offering and putting together for Prairie Creek. If, you, if anybody that rents right now, uh, the tribe, uh, our church tribe set up a ministry where anybody that rents right now could come to us and we will uh, rent them a home. Uh, and every penny that they pay for the rent goes against the, uh, the end cost of that home. And so they actually, if you're out renting right now, every penny that you give them, you lose it. You know, your, your landlord gets it. And you don't, there's no way for you to build up equity in that property the way that that system is set up. Well, that's not the way our system is going to be under the uh, church ministry, of the Native American church ministry. If you rent, then every penny that you put into that rent will go to a lifetime lease for you, for you so that at the end of the uh, of the time period that uh, that it takes you to, to pay the property off, then you've got a lifetime lease. You don't have to, you don't owe anything else. Once that's done, let's just say that you choose a, uh, again, I'm going to use $100,000, that you choose a $100,000 dwelling in Prairie Creek, and you can set that up to where your rent covers that, that end cost. Once you pay, once your rent has paid, that hundred thousand dollars, you don't owe anything else. Uh, you've got it, and for the rest of your life, you've got it. Mm -hmm. And uh, your children can have it. It's set up where you can leave it to your children and everything. Uh, if you decide halfway through that time period that you want a two hundred thousand dollar home house, then uh, whatever you've paid toward the hundred thousand dollars is equity that we just roll that over to the two hundred thousand. So you haven't lost a cent. Uh, so every penny that you pay rent in the Prairie Creek plan, you're you're getting something for it. It's not just dumping mm -hmm. it down the drain. So uh, please, Nathan, if you have some, a few questions, you know, and I think Judah will be happy to answer. Sure, yeah. I'll shut up. And, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I was just trying to kind of lay out the uh, general uh, plan that we're that we're under. We're trying to we're establishing and setting up. And so any questions that you have regarding anything that I've talk, talked about, please feel free to. Yeah, answer. I, mean, I could uh, come up with some questions. Uh, you don't have to answer all of them because if we're recording and if you're not, if you're not wanting to give too much information, then just say whatever you want. But okay. uh, I think it's great. Uh, first of all, that there's somebody like you who is uh, taking that Ubuntu model. I had heard about the Ubuntu model Years and years ago, uh, I haven't really been focusing on that, um, but I remember it seemed like 10 years ago when I first heard about Ubuntu model. Uh, it's the operating system for computer software Ubuntu that I use on my computer is actually named after that model, I'm pretty sure. 
and uh, it's exactly like you described, based on my memory, uh, a way of tribal community living that doesn't really involve money. And for years and years now, I've been a big proponent uh, of people getting away from money and realizing that it's not actually helping people do things. Uh, all of these religious ideas about money, that it's a store of value and it facilitates transfer of goods. All of that's not actually true is what I realized. And it's basically a religion that people just believe these memes about it and these ideas about it. And yeah. they don't really ever think creatively about whether that's even true or not. So I, I for a long time, uh, have been trying to tell people that they they need to figure out a way to live without money. And the gift economy is, a, as Mark Passio has termed it and other people have termed it exactly like what you just use the word gift economy. Um, Mark Passio, one of my uh, mentors and, and heroes, uh, a big um, spiritual teacher, he has always said that the gift economy is the most enlightened way to live uh, compared to a barter system or compared to money. Just giving things away to people because you care about them is ultimately the best expression of human cooperation and you know, the best way that people can survive and thrive in, in the most enlightened type of situ civilization. So it's very important that people try to go in that direction. So I have to definitely commend you for being able to think on those terms and realize that even on a small scale, we can just start small with a gift economy and just keep it internal to the tribe. Maybe we could right. network with other tribes over time who are also in that mindset and be able to uh, trade with them or just give things them and receive, you know, benefits from them. But at first you do, people do it naturally with their families, typically in, in a, in a family setting, you don't uh, keep track of everything everyone does with money and it works fine. It works much better that way because the money system is very inefficient and it's yeah. just a, a burden on people. So yeah. a couple of if you want to speak, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, you bringing the, the, uh, family up is that is actually how, uh, the tribes, uh, came together. It, uh, it was a group of family members that would form a tribe. And then you would get into your clans that, uh, were, uh, families that would, uh, stand side by side. They would grow out of the main tribe. Uh, because of the expansion and so you'd have a uh, a family that really uh produced a lot of a lot of people uh, or whatever and they would uh be a clan but they would work with still the tribe they were they remember the tribe but they were a clan of that tribe and so it was a family situation and that's what made it so strong and i i like your uh your analogy there where you know in your family you don't set and charge your children uh every time you feed them you know you don't expect them to uh to fork over something every time you feed them you love them and you care about them and so in the tribal way uh, you end up really caring about your tribal members because their family or their extended family or there are people that uh that you really grew very tight with because of the way that they develop. So it was a good, I like the statement you made as far as family. Yeah. And you also recognize that every individual has value inherently that because they're given talent and gifts by God, and they're just a human with uh, a soul and feelings and, um, you know, their own unique personality. That's where their value comes from. And it, you don't need to measure a person's value using the word net worth and base it entirely on how much commerce they do and how good at business they are. It's, it's evil to actually do that. So. Yeah, it is. That's uh, an interesting uh, concept of church and uh, the awful Native American church is not the normal thing that people think of as church uh 
It's not a, uh, where it's a spiritual, uh, it's not religion. It is a spiritual uh, way of life, and it's an earth-based spiritual way of life. So we're not religious, and I don't like religion. And uh, religion, the, the old church was really set up, again, like governments to control people. And uh, so when you got religion, you got all the hierarchy that is dealt, dealt, dealing with religion. Well, we don't have any of that in uh, the Oslo and Native American Church. That's not what we are. We're a spiritual group. And we believe the earth-based, uh, we believe that all things have a spirit. Uh, even a rock has spirit. Everything that was created. And Wakantanka uh, is the great creator. And so Wakan is, is a word that means sacred or holy. Tonka means size or big, large, large size. So Wakantanka is the great creator, the great spirit in, in, our, uh, in our church or our way of thinking. And so uh, it's a little bit different than, than the normal church that somebody might come in contact with. Right. So, uh I'm I'm fairly familiar with Native American uh not religious but spiritual tradition. Uh actually for about 6 years now I've been a member of a Native American church uh in Ava, Missouri, uh which is about an hour and a half from here uh to the east. Uh this the name of the church is the New Haven Native American Church. And I would say it was kind of similar. Uh, it wasn't a dogmatic uh, belief system as much as it was uh, recognizing that there is spirits in nature, uh, that, you know, there's a grand creator, the great spirit and stuff, and that every individual has their own path and people should respect, you know, each other's paths and not try to control each other and stuff like that. So Correct. Correct. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, you're right. So you've got some experience there. In fact, there was a church, there was a group down in Ava that uh, I have gone to some of their meetings and everything several years ago and several years back. But uh, was it the was pe group, peyote group ceremonies group or? Yeah. Yeah. See, see, I went to those peyote ceremonies for five or six years now. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a road man, a medicine person and road man through the yeah. church. So I can actually receive peyote shipped to me through the mail and facilitate ceremonies and stuff. So that's good. Great. That's neat. Yeah. I'm so glad you understand the road maps too. So <laughs> it's helpful. You're farther along than a lot of people are that I talk to. Yeah, I found tremendous benefit uh, on the spiritual side of things from using the tools given to us by nature and stuff. Yeah. Found it to be very detoxing, very humbling. Um, they're good for getting you more in tune with deeper thoughts, uh, helping you guide you on a, a positive path and stuff, I would say. Yeah. So, yeah, we have uh, several different uh, sacred uh, uh, things that we use that uh, really uh, it prepares you. From a spiritual standpoint, it it allows you to not be housed, so to speak, in the body. It, it allows you to get out of your body and 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 get into more of a spiritual connection that uh, a lot of people have trouble doing. Just they're they're just almost locked in in their uh, their body, their housing, and so there are things that uh, Native Americans have developed or used they didn't develop they used to uh to facilitate getting into more of a spiritual mindset and it just opens up that gateway but eventually a prairie creek settlement will um host um shamanic cer ceremonies um you know not immediately but so as soon as we get a little bit more you know uh settled so it's a great service to offer yeah. that and then food growing and stuff is an excellent positive uh, business and service to offer to people. So yeah, we'll probably uh, start off with sweat lodge because that's an easy, uh, good thing. It's, it's uh, relatively easy to set that up and uh, 
and it's a very good thing to go through. So uh, we will probably, that's one of the things we'll start off with. And I would like to get, uh, attract uh, drummers and get uh, drum uh, ceremonies going and everything, and dance ceremonies. So I uh, look forward to doing all that. And uh, we're working toward it. That's our future plans. Yeah, I'm very personally very excited to hear that, especially because it is relatively close to where I'm staying in Springfield, Missouri and stuff. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. coincidentally, yesterday I found a, a drum that I ordered. It was a larger saucer hand drum, um, you know, with a beater. Uh -huh. I got an amazing deal on it uh, as a sale on some app on my iPhone. I only paid $15 for this drum, and I, I already bought one from the same company, and it was pretty awesome, but this one's bigger. I, I got it for only fifteen dollars, so I was happy about that. Just out of curiosity, have you ever gone to the uh, that leather company in Springfield? Oh, I love that place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have a lot of interesting things that kind of changes from time to time. I haven't been there for quite a while, and I don't know what, as far as a uh, COVID how they uh, weathered that. I'm not sure what. Their situation is now but uh i used to really uh enjoy going there they yeah they're still there they're doing good business over there i would say they're thriving um they i buy i buy crystals there sometimes so oh good yeah mm -hmm. it's very is it very, very well known for crystals yeah they've got a large rock sh section of the shop they've got a large oh. leather section and then a large crystal section so i didn't know that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, uh, Judah, please tell us a little bit more about uh, the acreage uh, of PCS and uh, the, the piece of land that we can really start quickly to grow food on, you know, okay. so uh, what is the size of it and what are the tools available that we can use right away? Um, well, it's 120 acres. It is all paid for. So there's no debt against it at all. I, I paid cash. And so we don't have any, uh, there's no way that, uh, it can be, uh, a problem situation as far as mortgages or anything like that. And, uh, agriculturally it, uh, is set up on a, uh, there's a Prairie Creek is, uh, what we call the village Prairie Creek settlement and Prairie Creek goes through the property. And, uh, I didn't know it when I bought it, but the trail of tears also went across that property. And, uh, a strange thing just, uh, it just came back to me that, uh, after, uh, I probably had it for maybe, uh, seven or eight months and I went out to the mailbox. And uh, I turned around and in the, in the uh, fence line, there was this boy standing there and uh, looking at me. And so I turned and I looked at him and uh, he was looking at me. And uh, so I thought, you know, where did he come from? And who is he? And so uh, I looked at him. I kept looking at him. And I thought, well, I'm going to move toward him just to talk to him. And as I moved toward him and he was as real as you are right now. Uh, and as I moved toward him, suddenly he just, uh, what I'm going to call pixelated. He just, uh, he came, he just pixelated and uh, vanished. And you talk about weird. And, uh, but he was there, man, just so real. And that's right where I found out later, that's right where the Trail of Tears came across the property. And so, uh, there are, uh, there's a lot of spiritual things going there. And, uh, so anyway, the, uh, agricultural part is right up there on the, the ridge. There is a valley that, uh, uh the, the bottom, uh, land that, uh, Prairie Creek goes through. In fact, a couple of creeks meet there and, uh, we're very close. We're actually between the Gasconade river and the Osage fork river. So there's, uh, two rivers that kind of meet on both sides of the property within driver distance, uh, you know, just minutes. And then the ridge uh, that, that we farm and we're going to develop and everything 
is uh, kind of flat on on top, and uh, we've had uh, we had a uh, a raised bed garden there that hasn't been tended. Uh, that whole thing when I first started it out, I uh, started it out as a uh, Christian community, and it was non-denominational, and uh, I ended up myself going into uh, very, very quickly after I uh, purchased the property into the, uh, there was a movement to get back to the Jewish roots. And so I was involved in the Jewish roots community and learning Hebrew and uh, the Hebrew language and all this. And uh, so, and there were several people because I got into that, that was also in that. And, uh, but the uh, various churches, the Methodist, the Pentecostal, various guys, the people that came from those backgrounds would squabble and fight and uh, argue with about things, and uh, they uh, they didn't. Most of them didn't like the uh, Jewish roots thing at all, and uh, they didn't understand who Yeshua, uh, who they called Jesus, uh, was, and Yeshua was a Jew, both uh bloodline and religion and so when you start reading the the history of jesus in the bible uh you realize that he is tied to jewish period and uh so that's how come i was moving that away toward that way of thinking and uh anyway uh they got to arguing and fighting and uh, uh i had to ask some of them to leave i never throw anybody off but i just had to get to agreement with them that you guys you know you're not getting along and you don't like it you don't like them and them so why don't you just go someplace else and they did and uh so to make a long story short uh they didn't take care of the property that they wouldn't get out and work and help and uh, so everything that was there was up in really good shape when i when i uh when i had it but it's ran down and uh, they didn't take care of it. So one of the challenges we have is we need to go in and clean the place up. There's housing there that was uh, mobile home type housing, and we need to go in and clean it up and fix it up. And I've got a whole uh, plan on doing that. And then we need to start building our own homes. And primarily, I want to go as much as we can to underground housing. And uh, underground housing, there's really a lot of advantages to doing that and uh but uh from a standpoint of heating and cooling you just don't have the problems uh, if you go underground that you have above ground and uh, the cost is not there and you can make some beautiful beautiful underground homes they are just beautiful and uh so that's one of the things i want to uh to do but gardening uh there were several garden areas. The old one I bought the place, there's the garden that was there when uh, the people originally moved onto the property. And then that property was owned by some of the original, uh, I guess you would call them uh, Europeans that that uh, came into that, uh, that land. And uh, mostly around that, it was Osage, Osage tribe, uh, functioned a lot around in that area. There were mounds all over the place. And uh, so the history of the thing, uh, one of the people or first Europeans that moved in there and you can read about him in, in the literature, his cemetery, the graveyard is there on that property where the family is buried. And, uh, but they had the old garden, their garden area that was fairly good size. I used, I grew a lot of stuff there when I first moved there. And then we moved over from that and we put in a, a raised bed garden. And, and then when we put the raised bed in, it was, uh, and you can actually see it from a Google aerial map. You can see all of this. I can point it out to people uh, where that's, you can see the raised beds and uh, we had to put fruit trees in and everything. And I will be happy to, to uh, to have a program or something where we go ahead and show that aerial map and I can kind of point out what's there. And then down from that, uh, I grew uh, berries 
and uh, a lot of berries, which we need to do. And then from that, I grew potatoes and I've got pictures of, man, we've produced potatoes coming and going, just piles of potatoes out there. And so there's areas there that we have uh, gone, we have already uh, gardened and everything that are there just waiting for somebody that wants to come in and do it. And the land's all laid out uh, to do that. We don't really, uh, there's ways that uh, we won't need necessarily need tractors, but we've got a Ford 8 in and a Farmall H and a big uh, 2410, I think is that what it is. I'd have to look to make sure. That's one of the great big tractors with a cab and everything. One of those great big tractors that you see pulling uh, gangs of uh, disc and everything out. And when the uh, corporal, corporate, excuse me, the corporate farming, that's a size of tractor they use. And uh, I got a sawmill and we use the, uh, that big tractor for lifting up the logs and putting them on the sawmill to, uh, to cut lumber. And so it was really good for that. So that's the, uh, we've got a, 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 a back hole, it's an extend the hole and a case and extend the hole. And, and if you know what I'm talking about, on an extend the hole, your, your digging uh, bucket, you raise it up and hydraulically it extends out farther than the normal uh, bucket would, would uh, reach. And so as far as going underground housing things, we have that, uh, that uh, case backhoe that we can start digging uh, for underground housing. And, uh, are you kind of... talking when you say underground housing, are you referring to the Hobbit house houses? Hobbit housing? Yeah, that's one of the, uh, you can do the Hobbit housing. And I think they're really neat looking. And I like the way they look, but you can uh, you can do that or not do it on, on the ground. They look really nice as a ground housing, mm -hmm. but you 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 can go ahead and have uh, more than one level too, so that you can go in and you can have uh, your main living area, and then you go up a, a story mm -hmm. and a balcony and everything where you can overlook your uh, area down there. And so there's a lot of things you can do with that and uh, it will mm -hmm. work. Okay. And, uh, so. Okay, he's going to come back. Okay. Um, uh, but, uh, so. I like the looks of the Hobbit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, because we need to, to build a hoop house also because uh, seasons, the hot season is shorter there in Missouri. It's not mm -hmm. like in Texas or, or Florida. Mm -hmm. I did have a uh, a greenhouse up there. I don't know if all of the the uh, hoops and everything are still there. It wasn't a real big one, but uh, even with your uh, greenhouses, there's a way that you dig down. You, you uh, dig uh, out a, uh, a trench, and then you put your uh, cover over that, so that it's your actual growing area is down underground. I actually just you. did that. Uh, did you? Yeah, I just did that. I started it in uh, October. I actually dug this uh, about three and a half feet deep hole in my front yard here by hand. I didn't even use an excavator or anything. Took a couple months and I set up a Hugel culture uh, earth found uh, dirt foundation for compost. So yep. I had some uh -huh. pre pretty thick logs on the bottom and then I put about a four or five inch layer of oak mulch. Then I put a ton of tree oak oak leaves and leaves that I had gathered from the neighborhood with a pickup truck. And then for the top layer of soil, I just used black uh, compost that was that was aged and everything. So I just set up a garden over here. Gardening is one of my specialties as well as planting trees. Uh, I've got quite a few specialties. I've really been wanting to learn how to do exactly like what you're talking about, underground housing. And uh, I've been researching quite a bit about that. Uh, I, I'm signed up for an Earthship course right now that also uh, is designed for colder environments. So they have special heat heating in the floors and uh, rocket stove space heaters and stuff. Yep. So I've always I've been very excited about Earthships, and I, I want to learn some traditional building too uh, as well. But 
like you're describing going underground uh is providing you a huge uh, energy advantage to the point where you don't need gas and you don't need electric heating because when you need gas to heat your home now you're dependent on a, a company uh you know and you're dependent on money exactly. again yeah 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 one of the things that uh i really would like to get into is on your composting you can set up and you can uh get uh, methane gas that comes from that. And the methane gas, you can uh, burn it in the stove and there's a lot of things you can do with it. Um, I'm hoping that we can convert vehicles to burn that, to work on it. I had some people that I want to uh, to contact again, but they had uh, set a pickup truck that was running off of wood gas. And uh, that thing, they were joking but you could start down the road and stop and pull a bunch of stuff off of out of the uh, fence row and throw it in there and burn it. And you could drive and that thing would, uh, it wasn't slow. I mean, it, it would, uh, it would move on. And they were talking about, you could even throw a dead cat or something that, you know, that had been ran over in it. And it would, uh, that thing would process that and that truck would run off of that kind of thing. So there's a lot of things that we can do that to convert um, a gas engine to burn on something that uh, we can produce ourselves. Mm -hmm. and so, I've never heard of that. Yeah, yes, very uh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Vegetable oil can uh, can be our, um, can also make make the job. You know, if you go to restaurants, for example, and uh, and collect all the the oil that they are using there the old oil and then you just need to filter it and you know it's the system is very simple as long as you get it as pure as possible in in your tank you can uh, diesel uh, car yeah, diesel. vehicles diesel uh, vehicle uh, vehicles sorry can mm -hmm. use it yeah right yeah that requires a diesel engine but you can do that yes <clears throat> and, uh, you know right now i'm concerned <clears throat> about this push to uh, go to electric uh, cars. And I don't see, I, I think that we're in for a bad, bad uh, situation for a while. Uh, those things cost uh, several hundred thousand dollars and uh, to buy one of them and you can't charge them. They, they were showing, they pulled a pickup truck into one of the charging stations and it was gonna, uh, there's a meter that tells you how long, when, when it will be charged. And it was like uh, two or three weeks before it would be charged, and uh, you you can't travel you can't travel like that and uh, wait several weeks. You know, once your battery's down, to be able to go ahead and move up, go ahead and go. And you look at the number of cars out there on the road right now. Just go to any place and start looking at automobiles that are gas-driven automobiles, and start thinking every one of those has to be electric or they're, they're saying get rid of it. That's not going to happen mm -hmm. at all, period. And so those kind of things are things that we've got to prepare ourselves so that we can weather uh, those kind of uh, storms. And uh, it's going to take us doing that. We've got to roll our sleeves up and not get caught in a situation where uh, we don't have transportation. And to get it, you know, you got to spend several hundred thousand dollars with something that won't work and then those batteries are another problem too as far as they're so big and what you do with them so there's a there there's a pipe dream going on there that uh isn't going to happen no not for in the near future well another problem with them is the uh they have computers in them more so than a normal car uh with a tesla for example they have a whole special custom operating system that's coming from tesla servers and they even update your car similar to an iphone problem with that is that tesla is sold out to these globalist uh money and government powers and whatever the government wants in your car's software Tesla is going to be sure that the government can control your car. And if, yeah. if they want to shut you down and not make you not unable to drive because of carbon credits or because of censorship or 
They just don't want people driving. I, I think that's where they're going. They actually don't want people yes. owning cars mm -hmm. and driving like they have been, and they want them more right. locked into the city and stuff. Right. I think you're right. And I, I don't like to say, I, uh, there's a big uh, problem coming at us. That's one of the major uh, things I think that we've got to deal with. There's quite a few problems that we have to deal with, but that, that's one of the major ones. Mm -hmm. And just the whole monetary system and the banking uh, system. Uh, it's another problem that we need to circumvent. We need to be prepared to uh, to circumvent that whole thing, yeah. not, get, not get caught up in it. And like you're describing, but, one of the solutions here is for people to do things themselves and not be dependent on a politician or anyone else doing it. You right. want to be as an individual, as empowered and knowledgeable as you can be, because that's really the only yeah. thing that you have full control over. So that's that's the approach that I take, and that's why I'm interested in learning how to build homes, so I don't have to pay someone else $100,000 to do it. I mean, I think you can build homes very cheaply, really good ones, too. You yeah, just have to have the know, the know how and the experience. Right. <laughs> there are so many ways to do it. And uh, like I say, that you can build a beautiful home using natural materials and uh, that won't cost you an arm and a leg. And uh, we, we can build some beautiful, beautiful homes, comfortable homes. You talk about the, uh, the heating, you know, the, the ways to uh, go ahead and heat. And the good thing about a, uh, an underground home is you just have to bring that up just a few degrees. Because the, the normal temperature underground is not uh, not really is not hot and it's not cold, and so to cool it down where it's comfortable, you're talking about just bringing the temperature down a couple of degrees. To warm it, to heat it, warm it up, you just have to raise the temperature a few degrees, and so you've got uh, ways that you can do that in a natural uh, environment. And uh, cooling is uh pretty pretty easy to do also so well that's what you would want to do for a greenhouse too right mm -hmm. yeah yeah it'd be really neat to be able to grow uh some of the tropical uh bananas and uh, a lot of the tropical uh, fruits and things in a climate that we have like around springfield that uh, yeah. normally uh it gets too cold for a lot of those things but if you had that uh the, the the green out and ground greenhouse and uh it's um uh, it's doable me and my two closest friends uh we're we're very vegan and we uh have very eat a lot of fruit right um the problem with that is most of the th fruit right now is coming from grocery stores and trucked in from mexico and stuff I've I for a while have thought it's been a great idea to set up a large greenhouse and then try some of the more tropical trees in the greenhouse and stuff. So I, I'm uh -huh. I'm excited to try that for sure. You know, one of the things I really like about us being uh, able to go ahead and, and produce our own food is we know we're, we're not using any pesticides. We're not using any chemicals. We don't have to have chemical fertilizers and we know that the, the technology is there if you want to call it technology to do all those things where if you go to the grocery store you don't know where that was grown you don't know what they used on it you don't know uh, most of it wasn't uh it was picked green and and they uh either ship it or use gas or something on it to make it look like it had ripened and a lot of the things haven't ripened they, they just use gas to change the, the color and so you don't know and you know you don't know where it came from and you don't know what conditions it was grown in and when you really want good healthy food if you didn't grow it yourself then uh you don't know and we can do that it's just a matter of doing it and then we'll know what what we've got and what we're eating so one of the things I did, uh, since I'm in the city, um, I set up that garden outside, but I've also got a really good microgreen setup that I have in the garage right now. And, uh, I've got a two year food supply, uh, that, that are just seeds, uh, that I sprout. And so I've got, uh, five or 10 sprouter jars and the sprouts and the microgreens are, are such an easy way 
to grow extremely high quality. They are actually more nutrient dense. And I feel like if you sprout seeds compared to going and buying greens at the store that are way less fresh, the greens might be a week old. Sure enough, the sprouts sustain you a lot better and they're cheaper. They're exponentially cheaper to grow from seed yourself. And you can yep. you can buy a two year supply of these seeds and uh, you have the best quality, most healthy food available for two years that you just continuously sprout. And I've been making hummus out of the sprouts. You know, you can sprout it for five days, garbanzo beans, lentils, sesame seeds. Those <laughs> you sprout them out for five days and make hummus out of them. So much better for you. So much more healthy. You can tell it digests better than store-bought hummus. And it's cheaper, too. A lot yeah. cheaper. Good idea, Nathan. Yeah. yeah. There's some good programs out there on the business mo models of uh, doing the uh, that that type of growing. And they're, they're making some good money. People that are yeah. really into that. In, making some good money if, doing that. If we can combine our heads and our work efforts into a group tribal setting like you're describing, it's so much easier to grow a business that way. I I've, right. I found it difficult to get started with business as as just an isolated individual. It's hard to find clients. It's hard to do. There's so much you have to do yourself when you're right. just one person. Um, working right. in a group is going to make it a lot easier as long as the people in the group get along and aren't fighting with each other and stuff. Yeah. So. And that's one of the things that we, you know, it's hard to, uh, we, we can do the best we can do to screen people uh, coming in, but then we there, there's a way that you go ahead and handle uh, problem people. And under the tribes, the, the uh, people that cause problems they, they were out and they didn't tolerate it, didn't put up with it. So, and everybody knew that up front. And so if I decide I'm going to be a problem and I'm not going to be uh, somebody that they can get along with, I know I'm gone. And uh, that's pretty heavy uh, incentive to uh, try to, to be agreeable, especially if we get this set up the way we can. It's going to be... Uh, People aren't going to want to have to uh, leave that kind of a but of a situation that we can. We, we will can set in. up uh, the the rules also the few rules that we still yeah. that we must have, you know. And one of them will be like a probation period. Huh? There, there yeah. will be kind of a trial, you know, period uh, like six months or so, and so we can see if uh, people are getting along well together. Uh. This is where a solid understanding of natural law and and truly moral principles is going to be very valuable uh, because that's really if if you understand what your rights are and what you don't have a right to do, then it should be easy to get along uh, with most people. And yeah. I, I think that could be part of the screening process is try to give mm -hmm. people a natural law education. So then they right. are, yes. are. Yeah, that's what we've been they, talking about that also, Nathan. We have That's been talking about that, but please um, be, be our guest. Come in and give your classes. <laughs> yeah, sure. I've been teaching people natural law and stuff online, uh, following Mark Passio's example. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go grab a book about underground building that I think you should see. I'm not sure if you've seen this one. I found a really good one a couple of years ago. I can okay. still hear you, so go ahead and speak if you want to yeah. say something. Okay. I really uh, think that he's got a very, very good uh, attitude and, and aspirations. I really like his uh, his spirit. Very good he's spirit. Very good, Nathan. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, so this book is called The $50 and Up Underground House Book. I don't know if you've heard of this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's I, It might be kind of rare. Um, I bought it a few years ago on Amazon, but there's this one... It's not very big, but it's got a lot of really good uh, visuals, you know, visual drawings and stuff and, mm -hmm. and diagrams in the book. And it's just got some unique ideas, uh, some unique building methods, and they tested and actually implemented this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. that looks like, uh, who's the author? Mike Oiler. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I actually have gone uh, and stayed with Mike, and uh, he he was a character. He's dead now. He passed away. But I went and stayed with Mike and uh, uh, went in his greenhouses and his houses and everything. And uh, he had offered to come and uh, help us. And uh, but he his his brother or brother-in-law, I can't remember which, was an engineer, and so uh, he kind of helped design those things. But yeah, I know Mike. I, I uh, went and uh, spent some time with him. It's a very interesting coincidence there. <laughs> I didn't expect you to say that. <laughs> you know, in fact, uh, I was really uh, kind of uh, impressed. Uh, he had a greenhouse set up, and. Uh, it was a pretty hot day, and when I stepped into that greenhouse, it was like it had been in air conditioned. I mean, it just, uh, the difference in the temperature uh, from outside to walking in, and uh, Mike ran around barefoot <laughs> in mountains, and uh, he's an older guy. He's a character. Uh, he really is, or was. I really liked him. Yeah, but he's got some good... Uh, good plans so for this kind of stuff like the home building for example uh even the gardening um one of the things i was trying to attract to myself was some helpers who uh get along really well with me um just because i think for construction it's i don't really think it's a one person job uh, a lot of times you're going to be lifting like big logs in certain cases to build rafters and stuff right yep and, and you probably need multiple people to help lift and cut the wood and just multiple minds working on it so that it goes better and stuff. Yeah. That, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. I think it's, uh, it's kind of, you get kind of lonely, lonely when you're out there trying to do something by yourself and you get a group of people together that are all pulling together and you just can't, you can't ask for a better atmosphere. Well, the but, Amish are really good at that. Yeah, you know, they uh -huh. can put together a barn, a big barn, and and I think they can do it in like a week. You know, yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's fooling around. I mean, when they hit that ground, they're everybody's got something to do, and they know what their part is, and they just start doing it. And I've watched that and uh, enjoyed it a lot. Uh, timber framing, as far as knowing. Uh, timber framing, knowing your notches and your cuts and everything is another thing that uh, I enjoy. I, I just like the, the concept of it and the way that you would cut a log where you notch your, uh, your uh, place where you join in, where it just kind of comes together. And once it's locked in, it's locked in. No nails at all. You just drive a peg through it and uh, it's, it's there. And so I had a I uh, purchased a whole, uh, I mean, I, there's probably that thick of things on timber framing, and I hope I still have that someplace because it uh, taught all the notches and various things on that. So, yeah, I bought three or four books about building log cabins, uh, and the not the notches were were a big part of the book and stuff because you yeah. you can do it without using nails and stuff. Right. So yeah, yeah. I like that uh, you didn't have to use the nails. So uh, once you lock it in, it's there. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, you're gonna go out and buy a bunch of nails to put, put it together. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I'm learning that you might find uh, interesting, uh, I'm taking this law school level, uh, graduate level law school uh, course online uh, by this guy, Yusuf L. But what he's trying to teach me how to do uh, is how to write my own uh, business trust uh, private indenture agreement documents and then uh, maybe do a status correction with the government to tell them that I'm no longer a U.S. citizen. And he says you want to stop using your social security number and you don't want to work right. at a corporation. Instead, you want to know how to set up business trusts, which are private, and then mm -hmm grow your own businesses and then have uh, beneficiaries and trustees and stuff and be able to write all the legal documents, buy property and cars and whatever else you need and do commerce that way. And then you can legally uh, 
avoid taxes and you you'll be within your legal rights the irs won't be able to terrorize you and if you if you do it all correctly you also won't have personal liability which is a great way to protect your assets and stuff and this is also a really effective way to uh pool pool resources into a, a tribal group so that people can um join forces and be able to afford land and property uh, in a private capacity outside of Admiral Admiral U.S. Corporation jurisdiction in the common law. This is how this is one way we can easily regain our sovereignty. But mm. you're, you're not supposed to be receiving benefits from from the government public uh, stuff. So it's if since we're taking this approach of forming a group network, being in the private is going to be advantageous. What what you were describing with the church is another good way to get some of your rights back and stuff and avoid taxes and, and do commerce and things that way. So this book right here in this guy, it's uh, uh, Brent uh, Emery Johnson. Uh, he gets into all of that and uh, he's the one that has uh, set up our trust and his trust are They've withstood, uh, I think, 60 years of challenges, something like that. And uh, so it's, this is a good book. I uh, buy these, I bought these things by uh, a case, and uh, I set up uh, booths and things like it, uh, seed companies and things like that, and prepper uh, groups and what have you. But this is a good book. He he gets into the things that you're That's talking really about. Yeah, I'll have to look at that. I, I might have to order a copy. How to Live Free from Government, the American Sovereign. See, yeah. what they've done by labeling people sovereign citizens is kind of create a, a target for political attack. But being mm -hmm. a quote-unquote sovereign citizen actually has nothing at all to do with being in the private. Being legally yeah. sovereign and private is an actual known uh path lifestyle choice that a person can take and be completely outside of u.s jurisdiction you just have to know your case history you know you got to have a lot a, a good education in law to be able to set up these indenture agreements for a trust correctly so that the, like you're saying the, the trust that you have set up is apparently old and it's withstood the test of time and hasn't gotten in trouble and Hasn't had the IRS audit it and then take all, a bunch of taxes and, and stuff. So it's they've tried. <laughs> Have they've they tried? They weren't able to. Uh, he, he, it just it was solid. You know, where that's they, a good they sign. So, uh, it's not something you can easily do by just copying someone else's work and set up a trust correctly so that it's bulletproof. It, you you really yeah. have to know what you're doing is what I heard. Yeah, yeah, but we need to. Uh, I like the the uh, the protection that that gives. Uh, once you get this trust set up, uh, and you set trust up for the people that come in, well, then everybody's protected. That trust does what uh, it's supposed to do, and uh, the trustees they can't do anything but what they're supposed to do. The beneficiary has to stay out of it. And uh, if the treasury gets involved in it, well, then that nullifies the, the trust. And so you've got this balance that goes on there. And so by setting the trust up for each individual, the way that they want it uh, handled, and so allowing them to put their input in in the beginning, then it's just, that's where it's going to go. And so that land is, you know, uh, when you've got the trust set up, it can only do what that trust says it can do. And people change their mind. They can't, you know, they can't change their mind. Uh, the trustees have a judiciary responsibility to go ahead and, uh, and handle the trust the way it was set up to do. And a beneficiary can't get involved in it at all. And uh, so that's just, a, that's what makes a trust work. And uh, it's good protection. Yeah, that's how it works based on my research, too. Uh, you have the ability guaranteed by the Constitution to be able to contract unlimited as as a, a person or an individual. And even the Supreme Court 
will uh, enforce these kind of private contracts. The Supreme Court yeah. acts as both a government administration, administrator for the federal government, and they also act as a common law private contract enforcer. And this is all kind of hidden. People don't know about this, but because you can contract unlimited, the government's actually taken advantage of you and got you to sign in with the social security number to, to be a part of their authority. And this is how they're yep. able to boss you around and enforce things on you. But mm -hmm. you don't actually have to contract with them and you can set up private mm -hmm. contracts instead. Uh, and business trust is a, is a great example of that. So. Yeah, I'm, I don't, uh, I don't even like using social security numbers. I, I hope that we can, uh, my choice is that in the community, we don't even uh, deal with social security numbers. We, we just, uh, that's what you want to do to have mo maximum protection. Mm -hmm. You want to completely stop using your social security number. And it means you yep. can't work at a corporation. You have to build your own business as part yeah. of it. And most, all, all of our government entities are corporations anyway, and people don't know it, but, uh, the, uh, federal government, the United States is a corporation. And uh, every state is a corporation. And uh, so you're dealing with corporations that, you, that uh, are hiding uh, and not letting the, uh, the normal man on the street know what they're dealing with and, and how they're dealing with them. Because you can't do what you would normally do if it was just uh, the way it's presented. We, we've just been dumbed down. We've been lied to and dumbed down. I'm going to be posting, uh, I've been working on it, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to send that in, and uh, it'll, I think you'll enjoy reading it. Oh, the uh, manifesto, you mean? The, man the manifesto and uh, his, mm -hmm. his Brent's uh, article, that's what I've been working on right here, mm -hmm. Brent, so we need to send that in. I'm going to, and I want to teach classes on it, which is to start taking so step by step and educate people because they people like i say we're the united states people have been so dumbed down that they are literally uh it's a shame uh the uh as dumb as most people are they just don't know it <laughs> they've been lied to and manipulated and uh they don't know it and if you think about an empowered person that is responsible and as a true adult, what is one of the characteristics of that person is that they can do things, complicated things themselves. And people in America have been trained not to do that anymore. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that's one of the paths to spiritual development and sovereignty and responsibility and survival at this point is just learning how to do these complicated things yourself. Because you yep. know you can't rely on people you barely know, and especially not politicians. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, we're I, uh, sending in some paperwork and and uh, articles and things. I think you'll enjoy reading. Mm -hmm. Just our visit with you. Uh, I think you'll really. Uh, it, it'll be a, a good experience for you to, to uh, read to it. Yeah, I'm. I'm very excited to to work with you guys and and i'll for sure read anything you send me so mm -hmm. okay so we're going uh, to i don't know how to wrap up it's yep so yeah i've got some stuff to do to, today is very uh awesome to finally meet you um jonah and and it's uh it's good to meet you. your name's jonah right did i get it right judah judah okay judah. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice to meet you, and uh, thanks again for um, being on the show again, Celine. Um, so I'm looking forward Thank to working you with you guys. You. So uh, stay in touch and stuff, and uh, I'll be here working on my skills and study studying and everything. So all <laughs> Thank right, you. okay, okay. We'll talk to Bye. you next time. It's been a great show.